original innovation uh, for a game about vampires. So unfortunately, it wasn't a Vampires Award. I would love to have a Vampires Award, but uh, there's still time for that in the future because there is a Bram Stoker Award that you can get. From Bram Stoker. We haven't gotten it yet, but maybe one day. Um, so uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about a, a collection of work that we've been doing over many years, uh, and it started as a research project uh, a collaboration in 2000, that started in 2008 with the National Digital Research Center uh, and myself, and we had a team that was exploring very early location-based augmented reality games. Uh, actually, we started just as the first smartphones came out. You might remember the original iPhone and the original Android G1 phone. So those, that, that's how far this works go, goes back. But it's still active today. We've developed it further, and we refined our, our, our ideas and our game mechanics and so on. <clears throat> and that's the work I'll be talking about today. So once the research project was finished, we spun it out as a, as, a, as a company called Haunted Planet Studios. And the idea was that uh, the early games we were working with was really about ghosts and vampires. So, so uh, as Stuart said, I'm a multidisciplinarian. My background is in computer science. I have a PhD in computer science and master's, but I did a bachelor's in English literature, also a, a, a double, double major. Uh, so I've always been very interested in storytelling and in literature and in ghost stories in particular and gothic stories. So, so um, the work that we did at this time early on was really informed by this idea of ghost hunting. You probably know this popular perception of what ghost hunting is and you have TV shows like Ghost Hunters, International and Paranormal Activity and so on. So we were working with these ideas to try and see how can we offer cultural experiences based on that idea, this idea of ghost hunting as an activity. Um, and we bit, built a bunch of games around this. Uh, the very first one was Viking Ghost Hunt from 2010. <clears throat> uh, we have a bunch of papers about this uh, in some of the, one of the, uh, in Nordic High, for example. Uh, and that was really our very first attempts where we were working with, uh, uh, with the cultural heritage sites in Dublin and, and putting characters there and trying to tell their stories through these interactive experiences where Essentially, you played a paranormal investigator, you would find a, a paranormal activity, ghosts, and you would document them by making audio recordings and taking photos and so on. And you can probably see, if, you, if, you, if you're old enough, you might recognize this handset. This is the original Android phone, the G1, that came out. The very, very first Android phone that ran Android 1.0. And uh, we chose this over the iPhone because the iPhone at this time didn't have the 3D gyroscopes that we needed. The very first iPhone didn't have the same set of sensors as the Android did. So we chose Android, uh, and we're still, you know, that's still a, a, a main platform for us. And then over the sort of succeeding years, we, we made a bunch of different games. I'm not going to talk about all of these. Here's the vampire game, you know, uh, which is set in Trinity, uh, and which we did win the co a few awards for. And it's set in Trinity, a college in Dublin uh, uh, because Bram Stoker was a student there, uh, if you might know. So, so he went to, to Trinity and he was quite active in, 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 uh, in the Trinity life and the uh, societies and so on. Um, <clears throat> so we said again there was a sort of a riff on Dracula and we said it there because you know this was where he spent a lot of his sort of formative years in, in Trinity. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this, I have a, a video recorded talk if you're interested in the details. We, we thought quite a lot about the storytelling for this you know, and, and this idea of reinventing gothic storytelling in using augmented reality and we have papers and also recorded talk on YouTube about this uh, which I can share with you, so, but I'm not going to talk about that, that work today. Instead what I'm going to talk about are, are more recent work, uh, this, this work here called Kampen on Melon, which roughly translated from Danish means the, the battle for food or the struggle for food. I'm going to talk a fair bit about this project. Uh, and then I'm also going to talk about another category of work where we have a different kind of cultural engagement, um, which is the very recent work that we've been doing since 2002, uh, uh, games that are not ghost themed, but that are based on art and music. So what you find in these earlier games is ghosts. You play a paranormal uh, investigator, and in these games, we use essentially the same gameplay, uh, uh, the same mechanic and uh, mechanics and activities of the same game engine uh, to find art and music in your surroundings. So not as ghostly, uh, but maybe uh, a, a, a quite a different experience, but that still uh, looks very similar, you know, and feels very similar uh, to the other ones, but not as spooky. So we've uh, taken uh, 
Uh, here, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about this one, uh, but I'm going to focus on uh, synesthesia gallery, AR, and psychogeography with Jack V. Yates, which are two cultural experiences where we used uh, paintings by different artists and music you know, composed uh, specifically uh, for those paintings. Uh, but we have a couple of other experiences here. You might know Giorgio Decorico, uh, uh, the, the, the Greek-Italian painter, and you, of course you probably know Salvador Dali, and you might know that he illustrated Alice, uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland in 1969. Uh, so we have an experience that uses some of that uh, work as well. Uh, so this work is really, uh, I'll focus on, on these two here uh, and talk about how we are using these types of experience for cultural engagement. The first one here is, this is an, a, a Mosel Fort, uh, it's, a, it's a museum in Denmark. <coughs> uh, it's been a, a fort since World War One and it's been a museum since 2014. So for about 10 years. Uh, and before that, it was just a fort you know, that was there for people to, to use as a, as a public space, maybe as a tiny park uh, or something like that. Uh, and then it was uh, developed as a fort to try and tell uh, 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 an interesting part of Danish history during World War I, which, which is quite sophisticated and quite complex, and that was one of the challenges for us to deal with this material. Uh, we're grateful to the Vilax Foundation for their support for, the, for that work with, the, with this museum. So the museum got a grant for developing new types of experiences and uh, they uh, used that to uh, pay for uh, our time to help them develop this, uh, this game. One particularly high level objective of this work, uh, this work here was to try and integrate the process uh, of research with the educational activities of the museum. So this is a very small but very active museum. Uh, and they have a lot of activities already there with volunteers uh, and so on. And they wanted the research to, uh, uh, to be integrated uh, into those activities also. Um, the museum is interesting because it, 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 it's not a typical war museum. You know, it's not like you go to a fort and you see you know, cannons and uh, you know, weapons and uh, uniforms and so on. They do have some of these things as well. But the story or the history they're really trying to tell is about Danish policy during World War One, which is very interesting. Uh, Denmark was managed to remain neutral in World War One, so they so they were never invaded by the Germans, but they were very worried about getting invaded by the Germans, and they were very worried about getting bombed by Britain uh, in case that they were invaded by the Germans. Um, so it was a very tricky situation, and a lot of policy decisions happened at this time um, to try and. and maintain that neutrality right so so they for example the, the politicians would say to the germans uh the, the denmark would, uh, was under huge pressure at this time to export food to germany for the german front right? so goulash in particular so tin ca canned meat essentially um and the danish would say to the germans look you know if you invade us then we won't be able to buy coal uh, from britain which means that we won't be able to produce the goulash to sell to you so that was a compelling argument to the German. And they would also say to, to, to Britain, you know, so basically tell a, a, an opposite type of story to say, well, don't bomb us because then we'll get invaded by the Germans. You know, so, uh, so, so that was a, a, the, the sort of the type of, of balancing act that they had to, to place. Um, so, so it was in their interest to remain neutral. What was interesting also was that these pressures, especially in relation to food, meant that uh, Ger uh, or, or Denmark uh, was stuck with a lot less food than they normally have, you know, because a lot of the meat had to be exported to Germany. If not, the Germans would invade, uh, and that left the Danish uh, uh, population with a lot, a very different type of, uh, of ingredients for their diet than they would have otherwise had. So a lot of vegetables, and not particularly interesting vegetables, and uh, they came up with uh, policy decisions. Essentially, they educated uh, 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 women. It was at this time. Uh, to uh, to go into the little uh, villages and to educate the housewives um, to uh, to cook uh, whatever dishes they could with the ingredients that were left in the country. Right. So it was very organized in this way, and there was a big focus on frugality, you know, using everything in the best way, not wasting anything, and so on. Uh, grain was no longer used to make alcohol. They they they. They uh, increased the, 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 the cost of alcohol by, by a factor of 20 uh, in order to ensure that the grain would not be used to produce alcohol, but be used to produce bread instead, which was seen as more important. 
So uh, all of this story, it's a very complex story, sorry for taking so long to explain it, but it's this complex story that this museum are trying to tell. Right? And this is kind of tackle, uh, difficult material to, to tackle with uh, uh, in, if what you have is a fort. Right? So uh, they were looking at, at different ways to tell, tell this story, but I just want to show you what the fort looks like. Uh, here's a shot from above, you know, and this is the extent of it. You see. So it's not a big site. We have you know, some uh, uh, sort of battlements. Uh, we have a sort of a, a cannon tower there, uh, where there used to be a cannon. We have sort of a, a storage um, facilities, you know, and then where, where the soldiers could be barracks and so on. Um, so you can walk around this in probably about 10 minutes. So it's not a big site. And this is what it looks like here. Um, Yes, I forgot to mention here that a lot of these ideas that were developed at, uh, at this time during World War One became the foundation for Danish welfare society later on. So, so they developed a quite complex welfare state and very successful for many years uh, up through the 30s and 40s uh, and 50s. Uh, so these, this, these decisions and this thinking that emerged at this time became very influential for many years after. Uh, the museum also has sort of a, a lot of uh, activities, so they have volunteers that are dressed in, in period costumes uh, and they run events to try and attract and engage visitors and to help them reflect on how those issues that were developed at this time are still relevant today. And this is really their big uh, point about uh, this museum that they want to make this history from this time relevant to the challenges that we're facing today, because we're facing big challenges. So I'd like to show you uh, the core gameplay of the game that we produced with them. Uh, so they had a number of initiatives and our game is one of them. Um, and uh, I'd like to show you the, the, the core uh, gameplay. Um, I guess first I'll show you screenshots of the game modes and then I, ha I have a short video to, to give, give you an impression of how it works here. So when the game starts, this is for Android and iOS. When the game starts, you choose where you want to play it here. If you are play it in, uh, in Moses' fort, uh, then you get the stage locations that we have chosen. Right? So, so this is a, a game in, in, in stage mode, essentially, where we've curated the exact points where the encounters are. But you can also play it in random mode, in which case that our server will try and stage it where you are. So let's say that you're in Durham, maybe the Botanic Gardens, or maybe you're here on the campus, then you can click play, play random, and the game will stage itself to where you are. So you'll be able to experience the encounters, but not in curated locations. They're a bit random. One of them might be in the lake. If you're unlucky. Uh, hopefully not on the road. Uh, but you know, so you have to be extra cautious uh, if you're playing it in that mode. Um, so you choose which mode you want, and then um, the game screen looks like this. On the left, we have the three main game modes. Um, uh, the, at the top left here is the map mode, which essentially is an overlay on Google Maps or Apple Maps. Uh, and it shows where you are, of course, and then it shows this sort of purple outline. And the purple outline uh, essentially uh, tells you where the encounters are. Right? And this goes back to, to, to the idea of ghosts. The area is haunted. This is the area that's haunted. Right? So you can look at the map and say, okay, am I inside the area? Good, right? Otherwise, I'm not going to find anything. Um, notice that we don't show where the specific encounters are. Right? Why do we not show that? because it would be boring, right? This is a game, we want to have a challenge for the players. If there was a little flag saying go over here, then it would be like using Google Maps, which would not be interesting from a gameplay, uh, from a uh, player experience point of view. Uh, so we just tell you where, where you are. To find the encounters, you have to use the second game mode, which is on the middle button on the left, which is the radar mode. And the radar mode shows where the, um, where the encounters are. And you can see there's quite a lot of encounters here in this particular game. Normally you don't have as many, so I think this is the one where we have the most active at the same time. And you can kind of see they show up. This is like a naval radar. Uh, so you're in the center and you have this little radar beam surfing around. Um, and it, we have a little radar ping. Uh, and then we have the encounters marked with these sort of mysterious looking blobs. And your task here in this mode is to look around you and say, okay, it looks like there's something over there. Um, how do I get there? Do I walk down the steps? Or do I walk up this, or across this bridge? Or how do, how do I navigate to that location? And then you essentially exploring the site to get to that point. And when you get close enough, 
these LEDs you see at the top there, they light up and you can switch to the augmented reality view, uh, uh, which looks like this. And you're essentially scanning around with your camera and you're seeing the encounters. And you can see these mysteriously blurry figures. That, and they're blurry for a reason, because we want them to seem like um, mysterious characters from the past, sort of apparitions or revenants that are coming back from the past with messages for us. This was an idea that was developed uh, by, by the uh, museum people, this idea of the, the, the revenant apparitions uh, as an end of that point. And, um, and of course they are kind of ghosts, right? And they look ghostly, you know, they're a bit transparent, they look a bit spooky maybe. Uh, you can also notice for most augmented reality applications you might have seen, you'll probably have a color feed, right? And we did actually have that in many of our early games, you know, we use the color camera, but we decided because of the World War One aesthetic, you know, they didn't have color photography during the time of, of World War One, at least not widely used. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if they had it or not uh, at all, but it was not in general use for sure. Uh, so we have that aesthetic. We have photographs uh, from the time of World War One uh, that uh, we use to create those characters. So uh, the collab collaborators in the museum they found photos in the historical archive that we used as these characters. So this is a historical photo that we've cut out and blurred and made transparent. Um, so your job in this mode here, in the camera mode on the lower left here, is to take a photo of the encounter. And that documents the revenant uh, apparition or the ghost. Um, and once you've taken a good photo, you get sort of thrown into the, uh, the, the fourth and, and final game mode here, which is the case book. And here you see your photo. So this is the photo you took. It also goes into your camera roll, so you can share it with people. Um, and you can see here is more detail. Right? And the reason we add more detail in the, the photo you get is uh, that we want the, uh, the, the player to feel that they have a, it's a small reward, the extra detail. They can see the characters more clearly. And then they also unlock a, a little description you know, about the characters. This is something related to this is Folkekirchen means people's kitchen. Um, and here's a little bit of, of sort of historical text, tiny amount that says during the war, uh, the lack of food. Um, uh, let me see here. Oh yeah, oh, working and middle class could buy cheap and, uh, and healthy food in public kitchens. So the public kitchens were something that was instituted by the government and or by the state uh, as a way to deal with this shortage of food generally speaking. Right? So if you are short of food, go to the public kitchen and you get a healthy meal. Um, and here is some example, you can see these were the ladies that were cooking in a public kitchen. On that's a historical photo. So that's the core gameplay loop essentially, right? You find an encounter, you take a photo, and you review your evidence, your paranormal evidence, if you will. Uh, so I'm just gonna show you a, a, a quick video uh, with, uh, with gameplay here. This was not actually shot on the, on the fourth, um, Oh, is it on the other screen? Oh, here, okay. So hopefully this will work. So here I'm playing in the Russian Friedhof in the uh, cemetery in Weimar uh, with the presentation. So I hope the audio is going to work now. So you see the case book. Now we are reorienting ourselves to walk towards the next encounter. Oh yeah, here's the sound. Okay. So we are approaching the encounter. You can hear the audio building up as we approach. We get closer and closer. LEDs light up. We can now see the encounter. So we can switch to the augmented reality view. This is sound effects associated with the encounter. So we move around here. Right. Okay, I know it's sorry, this was a bit quick, I didn't have time to, to read it. But the text was associated with gluttony. So now the next step, I'll talk about this shortly here, um, is to find the matching encounter. So in this particular game, 
the encounters are matched in pairs. And here's me walking so you can kind of see where, where we're going. So we're here we're going through a park. So this is in random mode uh, at, a, at a cemetery in, uh, or our park in Weimar. So we can see we're tracking where we're going, trying to, to get to the next encounter. Oh, cyclists, be careful. Don't get blood in here. We're getting closer. Notice this encounter is red, not blue. I'll talk in a minute about why that is. This was an idea that the uh, researchers at the museum introduced. Getting there, so I'm zooming in to the camera, so we're getting closer. You see range is now 70 meters. Not far now. Oh, more cyclists. Yeah, you have to be really careful when you play these games, especially in random mode. <laughs> Close enough now, we're getting the audio. Radar ping is increasing in frequency. Okay, so it should be there shortly. Oh yeah, see, I had to go into the bushes here. It's like, <laughs> sometimes you get really good photographs. This one didn't turn out so well because there's too many bushes and trees. But. So the yellow arrow there, you might have noticed, shows you which page you pan to find the encounter. So the encounters are geo-pinned in a particular location, but they're also anchored to a compass orientation. Right? So this means you have a pretty good level of control in the stage configuration. What is going to be the backdrop? So we try and pick a backdrop that looks interesting. You know, but obviously, when it's random, you have no control at all. Right? So here, you can see I have to walk through the bushes. Uh, but I think you get the core idea. Right, so, so we move on to the next one. Um, and you can see there's quite a lot of, of encounters active. But you notice that one of them, as when I found the first one, all the other ones disappeared and we only saw the red one. Right? And then when we found the red one, we go back and all the remaining ones appear again. So I'll, show, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why that is. I want to see why more later. See the soldier here standing in the in the bushes with a with a gas mask. Of course, this is World War One. Okay, so that's the that's the core idea. So so we had this game engine. This was 2020. So we had this game engine that we used for all these ghost hunting games for a long period of time. And for the muse work with the museum, um, we had many some discussions about them. How can we improve this game engine to make it more suitable? For and these are the things that the museums requested and that we fortunately were able to implement. So we added this idea of the double encounter structure. So you see the green and the red encounter. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, in a second. Uh, we also turned the camera feed monochrome. I mentioned this already, right? which I think actually looks really nice. Um, we uh, had more accurate placement of the encounter visuals in relation to the horizon. So we can place them in a compass direction, but we can also tilt them. So if we want something that is shown a little bit against the sky, let's say we had a plane, but we didn't in this game, but then we could position it such that it would appear upwards rather than or downwards in that way. Uh, we also have an online version of the case book. So that, that mode you saw where the photos are and the descriptions are, we added an online version of that. I'd like to talk just a little bit about this idea of the poppy dialectic. And this was something uh, that the researchers came up with as a way to, to approach this material that they were working with. So the poppy, as a, I'm sure you're familiar with the poppy as a symbol of war, especially World War I. You know, you have the, uh, 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 the, the, you know, that's a day every year where people wear poppies in, in, in memory of fallen soldiers. Um, 
So we have this idea, we're working with this idea of the shadows of war and all the negative aspects associated with war. But then we also have this idea of the solutions that grew out of those shadows and those pressures and those, those trauma. And the researchers at the museum decided that the poppy flower was a perfect symbol of this because it actually grew on the battlefields of World War I. So it was a symbol of, of renewal, something that came from you know, the, all these shadows of the war produced, you know, this flower uh, and this renewal and this, this, uh, 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 this, this, this flower that became a symbol of new ideas uh, uh, that were good ideas. Um, so it, they used that essentially as a, as a, as a symbol of this dialectic um, between life and death, food and war, uh, between the shadows and, and the, the new ideas essentially. Uh, and that influenced the whole idea of this, this game uh, through this, uh, for example, through this double encounter structure. So we saw here the soldier, so we're playing it in English here. Uh, so uh, we saw the soldier, uh, his encounter is called battlefields, you know, because that's what he is, uh, the symbol of, uh, and we have the description here, the battlefield where the battlefields were soaked in blood uh, of soldiers. Uh, the slaughterhouses were soaked in the blood of animals, uh, and then you know this this um, uh, this became uh, 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 essentially the uh, the encounter that had to do with the battlefield uh, as an area where the, the war took place. The matching encounter is then the cornfield, right? Uh, so this is where food was produced from the farmer's labor. It was hard work, but peaceful. So we are. Uh, we're creating a, um, a combination of these two encounters. The battlefield is placed in constellation with the cornfield. Uh, so when you found the battlefield encounter using the radar, all the other encounters disappear until you found the cornfield, which is the red encounter. So it's like you start an encounter and then you have this combination of the two encounters that highlights a certain a theme here the battlefield uh, versus cornfield so the land the use of the land um, from two different perspectives and you might have noticed also that you see that here this is the the poppy side of the dialectic not the shadow side of the dialectic so it has the little poppy vignette there at the top of the frame whereas the battlefield had dead branches you know, to symbolize the shadows of war rather than the poppy so that's how we we mark this and this was part of this idea that the museum researchers came up with uh, of, of structuring uh, or using this double structure essentially. Uh, and you saw this already. So we switch from the radar mode to have all the encounters, first encounters, and then only to have the second one. And the moment you find that, you switch back and you see the remaining ones and you can find those. The monochrome camera feed, uh, here you see what it looks like. You saw that in the video. Also, this is from the actual fort. You, know, you can see it looks quite nice with the sea in the background. Um, the fort, because Denmark remained neutral, was never invaded by the Germans, but they were expecting they might, so they built some military installations like this one. So the fort was never used. In fact, during part of the war, it was used for growing herbs and and, and, uh, and other plants, potatoes and so on, because that was the you know the soldiers didn't. They were waiting like, to see are we going to get invaded or not. So they did this uh, in the meantime. Um, so we have these photographs. So this is the photograph that you take away with you as a player. This goes onto your camera roll. And we really tried to get an aesthetic that matched World War I photography as much as we could. Right? So we have the monochrome photos. We have these uh, characters that were taken from historical photographs. <laughs> Uh, and we superimpose them. You can see they're a little bit transparent to God, try and get them to blend. Um, and some of them, if you're lucky, uh, these are in random mode, right? Uh, but some of them, if you're lucky, they uh, uh, they look almost like historical photographs. Maybe not this one. Some of these. So we're trying to for this very high fidelity, this uh, uh, very convincing looking uh, uh, photographs. And also make them interesting enough for people to want to share. You know, if you wanted people to have something that they could take away, take away from, from the experience as a as a souvenir, um, and maybe share with their friends. We also saw people would often get 
their friends or family to pose with the characters. Yeah, that could be fun yeah, to uh, have yourself with historical characters there. The online casebook essentially looks like the casebook we have in the in the game. Uh, there's a little bit more detail. You know, this is the short description you have in the game too, and then there's a little bit longer description, and there's some link to source material. You know, that the historians from the museum had had curated for us. So here, this is Battlefield, but played in, in Danish. Uh, it's it's completely dual language, so if you don't speak Danish, you can still play it here and try it. And here is Cornmark, which is cornfield. Um, and we see here um, the description there. Okay, so um, just a couple of words here about the copy dialectics relevance today, because this was a big deal for the historians. They wanted to uh, engage uh, their audience, the visitors to, muse to the museum, to engage them with this interesting history from, from World War I uh, uh, Danish society at this time. And they wanted them to reflect on whether uh, those decisions that were made at that time, those types of decisions could work today in, in the same way. So, um, as you know, as a global civilization, we're facing enormous, enormous challenges, you know, with climate change and war and poverty and hunger, drafts and, uh, or not drafts, um, droughts uh, and floods and all of these challenges that we have. And it seems likely, certainly to the historians and to me as well, that we will need to change some things about our behavior, maybe use different types of energy, maybe eat less meat or no meat, as some people are suggesting. This was happening in Denmark too. The vegetarian movement was big during World War II, you know, for obvious reasons, you know, because there wasn't so much meat, so people were trying to find other solutions. Maybe those ideas, that creativity that came out of the society at this time so that's what the historians wanted people to reflect about. Um, so the cultural engagement in this game that we were working with was this idea we had complex historical knowledge, trying to understand something that was challenging, uh, using multiple perspectives through this poppy dialectic that was really the solution to, to these multiple perspectives, which I thought was, was very original, as it was the historians that came up with that. Uh, this idea of relating World War I problems to modern day uh, problems you know, uh, and seeing what are the similarities, what can we use today. Um, so that's what I have to say about uh, uh, Melon. Uh, it's a free download if you want to try it. We, we don't charge for most of our games uh, and they don't have ads and they don't have any nasty tracking so we're not very good business people. Uh, we're trying to change that. Uh, but this is a free game, so uh, if you want, if this sounds interesting to you, you want to try it, you're very welcome. Uh, iOS and Android. So I just want to give credit to the team that were sort of the main drivers so that we can have this. Before I move on to the next project, uh, any questions about this particular one? Yeah. Oh yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Yeah. Uh, I think it's very interesting to make uh, the way to the future more interactive and uh, more Immersive. So, do you expect the the user hold hold the phone all the time when they using your app? Only when they're using the augmented reality yeah. mode. Yeah. So most of the time when they're navigating, they just have their phone in front of them and they'll be looking around and then they'll be looking down at the radar and say, okay, I need to go over yeah. there and so on. So it varies a little bit. You know, sometimes we feel people look a little too much at the screen. You know, we prefer people to look more at the site, especially if they're playing it in staged mode. So, so it is something we're thinking about, but you know, this is the best we've been able to do so far. I don't think it's perfect. So, so, so do you consider transferring your app onto something like a virtual reality headset? Like maybe more into immersive experience? Okay. We, we have, yeah, I, it has occurred to us, but they're not, I guess, common enough for people to have uh -huh. yet, but maybe, Maybe mixed reality headsets will be good for this in the future, but you know, it's just we're doing work in mixed reality. Also, you know, I don't know if any of you were at our concert you know, last Friday. We had a mixed reality concert there for the Press Three, um, but um, uh, uh, so that could be some future work there. But we're not doing this work on that platform yet. And also, I don't think people are prepared to wear their Press Three in a historical site yet. You know, maybe with with the next generation of Google Glass or. Whoever's doing the next version of this, we, 
getting there. So we're not quite there yet. Other questions? Yeah. How do you evaluate the educational outcome of this? Like AR games are always very challenging in this regard. Yes. So we, we were hit by COVID when we were just about to do the, the, the evaluation. COVID broke out and then everything got derailed a little bit, the project finished and so on. So we're planning to go back and do a user study, uh, essentially get you know a bunch of you know, high school kids <coughs> to try the game, and do a study, either quantitative or qualitative, we haven't quite decided, or maybe a combination, uh, and, and try and see, do we achieve any learning objectives you know, with this? Because the intention really is that we that we will, but we don't have any values yet, unfortunately. Yeah, because that format app sort of audio capability, it sounds like this one's not audio, but I presume it's platform apps. So you said again? Because the platform app audio capability yes. as well, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have, so the audio capabilities are quite specific actually. So this is a platform, it's not running on Unity or anything, it's, not, it's our own code base. We have two separate code base for iOS and Android, which is a pain. Uh, but that's what we have. Um, but the audio is quite specific. So the audio that you encounter when you get close to the encounter, you heard that the audio appears. Um, that's uh, procedurally generated uh, from a number of small samples. So when you create a, a, a game of this type, uh, you don't actually need to do any programming. We even have an authoring tool. You know, so, so you can just upload five, four or five short snippets of audio, three to five seconds. And then the game engine will rotate them and generate a procedurally uh, generated soundscape for as long as you're searching for the, for the encounter. And we found that actually worked surprisingly well. It's a super simple approach, but we get a much longer soundscape out of it, rather than if we just been looping one sample, because that gets repetitive and annoying super quickly. Uh, and then we have one more piece of sound, which is when you see the character the first time, character appears on the screen that triggers a second snippet of audio which is only played once and that could be like a, typically maybe a line that the character would speak or it could be a particular interesting sound effect or, or something like this so so we thought quite a lot about this and we have a couple of papers specifically about the sound aspects of these games also I can send you if you're interested um, uh, so so there is sound support yes but that, that's exactly how it works all right, I'll move on to the next. Uh, so the next body of work I'm going to talk about is uh, two. I'm gonna, it's going to be shorter for each of them. Uh, we're uh, working uh, now over the last couple of years with uh, art and music experiences. So now it's no longer ghosts or vampires. You know, uh, now it's art and music. Uh, we still love ghosts and vampires. But uh, here is one experience uh, which is big, based on Jack B. Yates. Uh, this is a flyer from a, a concert that we had where we performed some of the music live. You can see uh, my collaborator Svetlana is in the audience there, uh, the pianist and composer for, for this. Um, and essentially what we did here was we took Jack B. Yeats's paintings. I don't know if anyone, is anyone familiar with Jack B. Yeats, the painter? No? Okay. So he is he's a, a very important uh, Irish painter. Um, and. Um, uh, he's a symbolist painter, uh, and he um, he was very influential uh, in Ireland and uh, uh, very well respected. And he also thought quite deeply about his art, you know, about art in general. So, so it's interesting from that perspective as well. Uh, place was very important to Jack B. Yeats. So when he painted, you know, it was often uh, uh, inspired by particular places, or maybe even particular places or peoples that he uh, that mattered to him. Uh, so uh, we took this idea of, uh, of psychogeography. I don't know, has anyone come across this term before? Okay, so psychogeography is a, ter is a term that was invented in the 1950s to describe essentially how different places makes us feel. And this goes back to earlier on in the, in the late uh, 19th century, there's this idea of the flaneur, somebody who just spends their time walking through the city, experiencing the city, uh, feeling and listening and hearing and, uh, and seeing essentially. So the flaneur is a, is a character that was sort of admired at this time or was developed as an, as an idea uh, by, by Baudelaire in particular. Um, and this idea of psychogeography is basically used since the 1950s now to describe the effect of a geographical location, how it, how it makes us feel and how it makes us behave. So it's kind of an interesting idea. And we found it naturally to combine it with Jack B. Yates because his paintings were, 
were influenced uh, uh, by, by this. So here's what he looked like, and you can see he lived there from the uh, last half of the 19th century to, uh, uh, to mid 20th. Um, uh, so he thought quite deeply about art, as, as I mentioned. Um, he was very uh, inspired by, uh, by many things, by many areas, Sligo in particular, but also by Dublin uh, and by the people and by Dublin life and so on. And many of his paintings uh, 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 are, are related to that. So here, for example, is one called Flower Girl. Um, and um, you can sort of see this was a painting that was really about social structure. We have a flower girl there on the right, you know, selling flowers to, to, to this uh, much wealthier woman, you can see by her, her fancy hat. Uh, so there's the, the whole idea of you know, social uh, class and status uh, in, in the city. Um, and uh, uh, that was something we engaged with here uh, in, in the music for this, for this that, uh, uh, that was arranged for this purpose. Here is a painting called Grief from 1951, which is uh, maybe the most Powerful expression of, uh, of, of Jack B. Yeats' abhorrence of war. So it's really, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, really uh, yeah, so it's a very anti-war anti in, in his philosophy. Um, this uh, originates from a sketch that was an, actually entitled "Let There Be No More War." That's an astonishing one. Uh, and you can kind of see this apocalyptic figure here, someone on a horseback in the middle, and you can see people fighting. Uh, so very intense, you know, painting and so on. Here's a, 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 a more optimistic one, the, the singing horsemen. So Jack Yeats loved horses. They played a big role in his paintings. Um, uh, this, is, this is a very jubilant painting, a young man on a, on a bright yellow horse, you know, and, um, singing to, to, uh, up to the, to the sky. Um, so I'm just gonna show you a few different ones. Here's one called Old Walls, which is really about I think uh, about memory and about aging. Uh, we have this elderly figure who, uh, who appears there. Uh, this one here, Liffey Swim. This is the Liffey is the river that runs through Dublin. If you haven't been to, to Dublin, uh, the Liffey Swim is a swim that still takes place in, uh, as far as I know, actually still in, in Dublin every year. So people, you know, swim a uh, certain part of the Liffey. Uh, and here are the onlookers, you know, looking at, uh, at the this is O'Connell Bridge there. Uh, and so on. So Yeats was, uh, Yeats was very interested in, um, in physical activities, you know, and, uh, like boxing and, and sports and so on. Um, so we use these paintings in our app. So we got permission from the National Gallery of Ireland to, to use these paintings in our app in an interesting context. So for Livy Swim, it was obvious to put it from the vantage point where it was painted. Right? So when you find Liffey Swim in Dublin, if you play it in a staged location, you see it here, you see this is, we overlay essentially the old Dublin on top of the new Dublin. So you get both places. Um, and I think that that works sort of surprisingly well, you know, and it, it's interesting to, to look at. And when you take the photo, you know, it looks like this. So this is the photo you take away with you. After this. You see some similarities in the buildings, you have the, the old and the new city. Um, oh, yeah, have a little bit of sound here. This is by piano by Svetlana and uh, violin and arrangement uh, by Kenneth Rice. But that's the music that's associated with this encounter. If you play it yourself, you can you can probably hear it. And again, this is also a free uh, a free experience. Uh, so in this, uh, essentially, it's the same gameplay as we have for the uh, for the uh, cultural experience at the fort, but not with the double encounter structure. So we took that out again for this experience. We didn't need it because we did have the multiple perspectives. Um, so this is an experience that. Is a little bit simpler in the gameplay, but pretty much otherwise identical. Uh, and the cultural engagement we were working with here was really this idea of art and music appreciation, you know, sort of helping people learn about art and, and music. 
a basic introduction to the artist philosophy. You heard there was a little bit of narration over the uh, music. That's, those are extracts from some writings related to Jack B. Yeats and some of the um, uh, some of his letters and so on and so he and his thinking. Uh, we try to relate the art to physical places of historical and emotional relevance to the work. So those paintings I showed you, we try to position them in areas around Dublin that resonate with the material and the themes that these paintings uh, 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 capture. Okay, so that was Jack B. Yates, Cybergeography. Any questions about this one? I have a last one. I know we're getting running out of time, but I think we have another five minutes. Any questions about this one? So you can see it's a different type of cultural engagement we're dealing with. We're not dealing with history in the same way. We're more dealing with art, music, and thinking about our, our philosophy, maybe sort of basic art philosophy uh, and psychotography, of course, big deal for us. The last one uh, I'm going to talk about here is called Synesthesia Gallery AR, and essentially it's the same game engine, the same type of experience that we have with Jack B. Yates, but the material, again, is different. So this, this uh, game here contains 15 episodes, so 15 encounters. Um, we've broken them up so you don't see them all on the radar at the same time because that would sort of be a bit overwhelming. So they're in three groups. Um, and then there's music by Liszt, Chopin, Scribin, and others. Uh, and that music, in many instances, has been painted by artists since So I don't know, do people know what synesthesia is? A few people? Most people, okay. So just for those of who don't know, synesthesia is a, is a cross-modal wiring of the brain. So people with synesthesia, they uh, would have, have one experience that would trigger a secondary experience. So if you have ever sort of thought about uh, uh, or, or, uh, having experienced or you met someone who's experienced that maybe Tuesday has a color, for example, it's always yellow, right? Or somebody might hear a sound and they would uh, experience a taste, for example, at the same time. So it means that the brain is, is cross-wired uh, cross in an interesting way. You know? So it's, it gives you a secondary experience uh, uh, in addition to the primary sensory experience. Um, so uh, a lot of synesthets are, it's maybe it's about 3% of the population, I think, are, are synesthets. Uh, so it's surprisingly common, you know, when there's uh, uh, no negative side effects, really, it's just an extra uh, experience. And a lot of synesthets work very creatively, you know, so in, in, in music or art, uh, other creative uh, uh, fields. And, uh, and there's are many of the uh, creatives uh, you might know, uh, Kandinsky, for example, and many other artists as well. Uh, so um, we have these 15 episodes where artists and artists painted uh, music, for example, um, uh, and then uh, we, we constructed these 15 essentially artistic experiences from people who have made significant contributions to research into synesthesia, uh, art as well as science. Right? So uh, some of the episodes that we have are one by Carol Steen, who's the president of the American Synesthesia Association, James Wanerton, who's president of the UK Synesthesia Association, Ning Hui Chong, who's uh, from the China Synesthesia Alliance, and, and others as well. And we have a scientific episode by Jamie Ward from Sussex, who's also he's a professor uh, specializing in this area, and gives a, a scientific, short scientific talk on this topic. Um, so, so, uh, so the encounters, again, are very different, you know, from Jack B. Yates and from the World War I Museum. Uh, there are a, a music experience with this particular theme. And here you can see uh, some uh, screenshots taken in random mode. This is in the mountains somewhere in Austria, I think, maybe. Um, and uh, you can see some of the paintings here. I don't know how you can see the brightness. Also, some different ones here. So these are the kind of screenshots you get. This is by Okay, um, so essentially same type of gameplay as we had before, but different type of cultural engagement. Again, art and music appreciation. We're trying with this particular game, we're trying to raise awareness of synesthesia and of, and of cross-modal experiences and the diversity of, of perceptions that arise. So one thing that, you know, synesthesia, synesthesia of course existed for probably as long as there's been humans, um, but it's only become sort of general awareness has increased over the last few and it's been a, a bit of a, a, a challenge, I think, because many synesthetic children, for example, they will 
And a very common type of synesthesia, for example, is you look at a letter and you say, oh, this letter has a color. A is obviously blue, but two are kids in it, or green. But you might know that when people, people in a primary school, they learn the alphabet and so on, they often use colors for different colors for vowels and colors for consonants. And this was a source of great confusion. This, these types of assumptions was a source of great confusion because if a kid would say to their teacher, hang on, A is not red, it's yellow. It's obvious that. The, the teacher would might not know how to deal with this, might thought maybe this kid is not quite right in the head, but you know, the kid just had a different perception of this, right? So it's important to increase awareness of these types of experiences to prevent these types of problems. It's even been cases where people have thought, well, pe people with synesthesia are hallucinating, but it's not a hallucination. We know now it's impossible to form it. So, okay, so it's important, I guess, this idea of racism. Okay, I just want to give credit to this team also. Uh, uh, so you see here, good overlap with the previous teams, uh, but here they are. Um, so collaboration, this is a collaboration with Svetlana, who's here today also. Um, and Roshin is our software developer, Ken Weiss did the violin and so on. Neil Delaney. I'd like to invite you um, if you like this type of work, I'd like to invite you to a user study we're doing with the music department uh, at, at, uh, uh, here at Durham. Um, we have another experience that I haven't talked about today called Alice Dali AR, where uh, we took those images I, I mentioned earlier from um, that Salvador Dali created for Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and we placed them uh, uh, around uh, the botanic gardens uh, along with music uh, composed by uh, Svetlana specifically on those images. Um, uh, so we're doing an, a user study on intergenerational play uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Kelly Jakubowski from, uh, here from, the, from Durham and the music department. And it's the weekend of 24th and 25th of February. So uh, since it's intergenerational, you know, if you, if you know a kid or you have a, have a son or a daughter or maybe a nephew or niece or something, or if you know a grandparent with a kid, you know, be interested in, in joining, please uh, invite them to, to come along and play. It's in the Botanic Gardens right next door to the stage there. I'd also like to invite you one for one more thing, which is our mixed reality study and art exhibition that we're running tomorrow afternoon over in the music department. So another body of work that I haven't talked about at all is on mixed reality, also art and music. Uh, and we're using MetaQuest Pro or Quest 3 as what we're using now because it's actually better than the Pro. Um, so if you'd like to participate in the study and experience some art and music in mixed reality, uh, scan this QR code and enroll and you'll be very welcome. Okay, final slide here. In the future, we're in this EU project called Loka Culture, uh, where we're making location-based uh, augmented reality games for cultural heritage sites. So that will be the next generation of this work, which is we're in the process of making. And that's it for today. I think I just managed to finish on the dot. So thank you very much. And here are my coordinates if you want to get in touch. Okay.